Did either of you get a chance to to check out that interview? So yeah. great. And yeah. He's so peak Lou. And oh. you can. Oh, see... I don't know what Drella means. And yeah. you maybe, can maybe. tell you can tell Evan he was a little bitch and was like, <laughs> "I'm interviewed first alone." Yeah, and then we'll play our oh, yeah. fucking song, and then I and won't then, talk, and, and you then, can talk to John. And, and John, and, John looks like someone's holding a gun off yeah. camera. John's uh. like, <laughs> and and John, yeah. so John's like Ringo. Well, we'll get into that, and yeah. that that's a wonderful uh, interview. But John's like Ringo. He's like, I just thought it'd be a great chance to get back to the energy and the excitement of what we were doing with the Velvet Underground. Yeah, he was like, he's got that great line. There's it. <laughs> He says it's an elegant piece of reporting how misfits get together and create art. Which is beautiful. A, a beautiful, succinct yeah. way. What are we talking about? Uh, we are talking Ow. about Ow. <laughs> uh, a, 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 an old Czechoslovakian custom my mother passed on to me called Songs for Drella. Uh. Um, no, in so, okay, let me start it this way. Hold on. Piano riff. <laughs> In February 1987, Andy Warhol died. This, this is what is John Kale, This is what John Kale had to say. I read about the death of Andy Warhol in the New York Times. I was shocked. I had not even known he was ill. Besides, despite the fact that the theme of all of Andy's work was death, we had all presumed that he would outlive us. His life force was so strong. I felt totally helpless, exactly the way I felt 20 years earlier when I read he had been shot. There was nobody I could call to talk about it. I don't think Lou could have had a clue how I felt about Andy. I had always felt emotionally close to Andy, always. Mm -hmm. And he always welcomed me whenever I showed up at the factory. I went to the memorial service at St. Patrick's Cathedral on the 1st of April. The date left us all wondering if Andy would appear. When he did not, we went to a nearby hotel for lunch. Lou and I were both at this party following Andy's memorial service with 150 of the most famous people in New York plus Andy's family. It was the first time we had spoken to each other in some time. We had bumped into each other a lot of times before, but he wasn't interested in communicating, probably because I was still drinking. Billy Name was standing between us and included us in his conversation. He was talking to Victor Bacris, who got square, scared and ran away. First, Julian Schnabel came up to me and bulldozed the idea through. He said, look, you've got to do something for Andy. I applied it would be a bit tough to do anything now. No, no, let's you and me and get together and write something. Then he said, let's get Lou over here. I thought, what the hell is Julian doing? Does he always do this for people? The first time I saw him, he was a busboy at the Lower Manhattan Ocean Club, but now that he's got these paintings with the plates smashed all over them, he's got a whole new view of life. This is what success in New York gives you, a big mouth. A few he's... days later, Lou and I started to discuss doing a collaboration. So that's the genesis of the album that we're discussing now, Songs for Drella. Um, in 1987, just as... Uh, just as Kale is embarking on the uh, Falkland Suite, the words for the dying album that we discussed uh, last time, and just as Lou is about to uh, embark on the album and tour, uh, massive tour for uh, his classic record, which is often considered his sort of comeback record, New York, mm. um, which had his biggest hits since walk on the wild side on it mm -hmm. uh, yeah they meet at uh andy's uh <laughs> funeral and um and float the idea of of doing a, a, some sort of collaborative work to 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 uh memorialize him it's um, interesting if i can interrupt for a sec that yeah. Uh, I, it's, I'm, it strikes me that this moment finds them both almost sort of, I mean, they're both kind of ready to do something elegiac. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Kale mm. had been working on words for the dying and then Lou, you know, New York has a lot of mourning in it. And that song Halloween parade is this masterpiece of mourning. Yep. You know, uh, um, various friends who, and acquaintances who, who died of AIDS, uh, you know, in the eighties 
and uh you know lou in the the next album lou releases is going to be magic and loss which yep. is much yep. more what i i mean this is a whole active. this is a whole other podcast but i feel that Lou enters here at the beginning of the nineties into a real renaissance. Like his, mm. this is his, his late period golden. These are his golden years um, with, with New York songs for Drella and magic and loss sort of comprising what really, I think the argument can be made is, is, is Lou's American novel in song. Um, there are these three records, uh, of really tightly focused work, these song cycles, really, they're not just That's a true, bunch yeah. of songs thrown together. They're all song cycles mm. with recurring themes, themes of, of death and of fame, um, of public personas and private personas, mm. um, of personal biography, but also social context and and historical significance um that are sort of carried across the three of them and i think he really and marked by i think his the sharpest uh clearest most like strongest literary writing of lou's yeah. career mm -hmm. across all three of these records the, the the lyrics are fantastic um and we'll get into a discussion of who should get credited with what when it comes to songs for Drella, which is a sticky, sticky, mm. sticking point. Mm. Uh, but I, for my money, like it's it, the lyrics, the words are undeniably Lou 90, 95 percent of the even, way across. Even when Kale's singing? Even with Kale singing. Yeah. Mm. yeah. There, there are points where I, where I had that feeling too. Okay. Um, where it, it's, it's so Lou. Uh, where the preoccupations are Lou and the voice is Lou, the style is Lou. He's just, he's really like, they're both, but both of them, but for John, John is at this point where he's, uh, he's moved away. Uh, he got into such a rut with the rock pop thing. Uh, and then he moved away from that and he did Words for the Dying, which interestingly enough, also a work preoccupied with death. Yeah, right. Uh he had, so they're both coming from these these yeah. these works. But for 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 Lou is coming from a record that he just did that is is maybe the the finest point of his journalistic uh eye on the street man of the world, you know, writing that 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 kind of de defines the best of what he does as as a writer and john is coming from words from the dying which is this fantastic example of his abilities as a as an arranger and a composer of musical settings and and so yeah i think they're both primed for this because they both come together and what it, it yields is this perfect marriage of those two things of these incredible uh lyrics that to me feel almost predominantly like the work of Lou working at the height of his powers and these musical settings, these, these musical beds and arrangements that, that feel like John Cale predominantly, you know, creating yeah. and supplying um, again at the height of his powers. So to me, it's a power, it's a powerhouse record and it's done in service of uh you know, a a a person that they both yeah. had very very strong personal connections to, and so strong that it was in it enough for them to be able to put their own egos out of the way, at least for the, the composition and performance <laughs> of the songs, um, to deliver what I really think is is a a high point of both yeah. of their both yeah. of their both of their careers. It really it really should not work if you think about this idea on paper. It's right. almost yeah. like we're going to You're going to make a musical about Andy Warhol dying. And we ha yes, and we haven't worked in together in 20 years and when we do it's trouble and there's no drums and like Right. and it's but it's and it's kind of got a theatrical bent to it. And yeah. it's like, "Oh no." It's this like a performance art gonna... piece, but yeah. It is well, one of the it, most affecting 
out. I mean, it, it just really emotionally opens me up every time I listen to this. It's so, incredible. It's there are very few records that do what this does. Um, and you know why, it, Evan? Well, I do real quick. I just think it's not only their friend, but it's so much about how friendship tangles up with art. Mm -hmm. And that just, which is another preoccupation of both of them. As, yeah. As, as, but it's also, artists. it's also about how it seems. I mean, this, this thing that happened could only have happened if it was uh, gathered around an absence. Mm -hmm. Like the only, the only way that they could subsume oh, yeah. their own egos in anything was if there was something deep a that bigger ego that they could that, both look that, toward at the also, same time. Also a bigger ego. <laughs> like, yeah. Andy and Warhol as a sort of imagine and Ryan, Warhol, when you're talking about yeah, the yeah. absence of drums. Yeah. Like if you if you watch the you know the performance that was taped, it wasn't a, or the dress rehearsal that was taped. You know because the orchestrations are so sometimes very complex, and because they depend on rhythmic like a like a metric consist like um, a consistency, I guess, uh, and because there's no drummer, they have to look at each other a lot across the stage. Yes, yes. To, yeah. to make like to make sure that they've got the right beat and you know nobody counts anything off you can see it in their eyes yeah see them count off with their faces right this now, is um uh, it's the perfect the it's the perfect time. punishment it, this is uh yeah. this is john speaking to that <laughs> that point i was really excited by the amount of power just two people two people could produce without needing drums when we started work i was always in the back of my mind wondering where the hell does the backbeat go and by the time we finished it, I was saying, thank God we don't have one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because they don't need it. Those arrangements um, aren't about backbeats. It's true. No. And and to me, with with because of, I think it's because to me, these songs were it's they're like um I think musically it's a great work of chamber music. Yeah. These are um, songs, these are songs for which drums are not suited. Oh. Yeah, there are songs for what drums, are drums for which songs are suited. Get it out of here. Maybe a Velvet Underground reunion. <laughs> Maybe, which will come up later. <laughs> very briefly. And, and very if, I could just, if I could just do the one cool visual spoiler. The last thing they worked on mm -hmm. together was White Light, White Heat. And if you tilted it, you could see Billy Name's skull. Yeah, tattoo. that's true. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and they if did you a very do smart... this, you can, you can see, see Andy. Andy. Where did and you that get is... that? The record? Yeah, is that a reissue? Is that the or is I that bought, the original? I bought it at the store. Uh, I got this oh, at uh, uh, Trace Cato's in Jamaica Plain. Uh, I, I think it might be a reissue. It's not original. Ed. That's uh, anyway. Yeah, it's very cool how they but did to, but that. To, to and that's a that... Billy. That's actually a Billy name photograph of Andy. Yeah, so it's just, I mean, yeah, for, it's from, the, from and, the cover, it's perfect. And not only perfect as a reference, but Andy's a ghost. And it's yeah. the ghost of, of yeah, it's just great. The whole thing's great. Uh, and, you know, to me, um, yeah, I just think it works. It works like this sort of chair. There's the interplay between john's guitar predominant i uh, mean john's piano predominantly and occasionally the viola but mainly between john's piano and lou's guitar is mm. this incredible incredible just in it, it, like this complex fascinating interplay this dialogue yeah. of instruments and there's throughout the whole album there's like Lou has two main guitar sounds, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He has this the clean crystalline, clean yeah. sound that is like a piano. It's so big from top to yeah. bottom, and then that super sustained fuzz uh, that's like a violin or something like that. Yeah, that's and then, wonderful sounds, and it looks like he's playing them. He's playing the same guitar the whole time, and it looks like he's playing through the same amp the whole time. Yes, he is. He he's got a pedal board with maybe twelve pedals on it, and every like. That's all Most I need those, to create these two yeah, very distinct yeah. sounds. This is also I, I from a guitar geek standpoint, uh, Lou in this period, pretty much starting with New York, but through this whole period, Lou has has sort of solidified this amazing tone yeah. for himself. It's unlike I, I've never heard a guitar tone, guitar tone like it. Well, he was having like um, 
people would make pedals to his specifications. Oh yeah, yeah, think, no, right? he, was like, very, he was like he yes, was like he was actively he was, he was very and he'd always been that way in the Velvet Underground. His original guitar that he had it was a Gretsch Country Gentleman. Yeah, but yeah. he modded that guitar so heavily that he actually made it unusable in the mm. end. That he he changed it so much that eventually he couldn't even play it anymore and had to replace it. At this point in time, he's playing these custom made guitars that are sort of tele shaped. Yeah, um, right. They're Schechter bodies with, uh, I think he has like a graphite neck, so it's not a wood neck. It's mm -hmm. it provides this super crystalline clear yeah. tone and this tuning stability that's insane. Like yeah. there's never mm -hmm. like when you hear him play a big open chord, there's oh nothing like it's perfect. It's like a perfect chord. Uh, and and he then was... he and then he get yeah, it's just fantastic. And then he gets this overdriven sound. He has like a series of like five different fuzz pedals that he uses. It's interesting to me how much he adored like the pursuit of clean. Like he often mm -hmm. talked about why he loved CDs. He was mm -hmm. like, I can't believe how clean they sound. Like, like for, yeah. for him yeah. to be the advocate for clean sound, considering how this all began is just, um, yeah, but I think he understood that dirty only means something on a boulevard. If, if there's no, <laughs> if there's, if there's clean, you know, like clean, of course, uh, allows the parameter by which the dirtiness can exist. Let's just for um, listeners who might not let's just bring it in a little this, bit. This this was the single. I remember hearing this on the radio. Do you remember that? I do not. Hearing what on the radio? Nobody but you. No, it's I hard don't. to it's hard to imagine. Oh, I'm ninety five point five WBRU before Since it became I'll a Christian show. rock station. <laughs> this was the only point where I wondered whether there was a bass player. There isn't because he produces the same sound live, but there's kind of a slide up. Boop, boop, boo, doo. Yes, yeah. That's, I think that's, that's just Kale on his keyboard. Yeah, that's a keyboard. Which is crazy to see in the video him playing the piano and then this keyboard on top that looks like a, it doesn't look impressive at all. Right. Oh, is it like it a looks Casio? like some cheap little Casio or Yamaha. Sometimes but it sounds that'll great. do the trick. So it was just all about how you use it. So the, I don't the wanna... orchestration is so impressive because he's essentially playing two instruments at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, yeah. I don't know how we get through this because I it's I think we go chronological. Yeah, yeah. Because um, they're like it's you know it is a chamber piece and the uh, and so oh and I also, love and also... I just love how they jump from point of view like Lou's yes. able to write in Andy's voice in his voice as Andy's friend as a third par omniscient party like. Yeah. It, they just jump around so adeptly. Um, it's really stunning. Yeah, it was something they talked about a lot. Like, what are our rules about? They did? Yeah. Is it? So what were some of the rules? Uh, well, no. just that, you know, trying to make the songs that were in Andy's voice in Andy's voice. But, you know, John points out that, like, there's a point where things inevitably bleed and... You know, he talks about the song Forever Changed. Mm. Um, and he says, you know, that song is from Andy's perspective, but when he was singing it, he felt that he was singing as much about himself. Yeah, it mm. sounds like that. Um, and that's yeah, actually always... one of the songs where I feel like that that Kale might have had more lyrical input into it. Yeah. This song, Small Town, this is a Lou song. Oh, totally. Uh, and, uh, and in every way what's so great about this uh, this if you want to see this as the artsiest musical of all time yes yeah this opening is perfect this is yes, such a musical i know opening. you yeah. can it's feel the just, curtains like open. the piano oh, is the just God. pounding and some of the well welcome to <laughs> mulberry patch <laughs> i didn't see you come in there <laughs> well, <laughs> well listen, I'm Andy welcome Wall. to my small town it kind of sucks i bet you're wondering <laughs> how i ended up here <laughs> <laughs> in New York City, yeah, and then yeah. And, the, and then the set of New York <laughs> rises yeah, up in the comes background. Up in the back. <laughs> honk, 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 honk. There's a bus <laughs> and a train. Oh my God, an aeroplane! Um, oh, I can't buy that as my door. Lou's delivery is peak Lou. Yeah, um, this is what U2's impression is based. on. Yes, like, this, this is yeah. what it's based on. It's this yes. period. 
in this song. Uh, uh, it's so uh, clipped and precise. And it, you know, it's great. In that interview uh, where Lou talks about having a three-note vocal range, um, he also says that, you know, he says, like, you know, I love, he says that I love the New York regional accent, and I yes. have that. Yeah. And he deliberately uses it. So, like, this voice, uh, it is a voice that Lou does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a cultivated thing. Uh, sure. And I think one of the reasons this album works so well is that both he and John are such theatrical. They're actors. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it really works for them to do something where they take on... Uh, a different character and i love the intelligence with which they decided to divvy up the songs like when lou does andy the andy that lou does is a mm -hmm. different side of andy from the like john does the yes. very sophisticated like talking about art he does trouble with classicists nice. john uh, almost does the inner world and like and like lou has to take care of all the exposition <laughs> yeah he's like yeah but, but andy lou was a also, catholic lou, lou, lou is also that lou is also the practical andy yeah the, an, the andy work. is about work like yeah and open house and like this is the the this is it but whereas whereas john is the style it takes this is this trouble is so with beautiful. classicists this is a gorgeous song We've uh, listeners. We've had a as we prepared for this episode, we've had a joke going on in the text thread where if Ooh. someone just texts three lines of whatever, if someone can add to the end of it, open house. Open house. <laughs> so it sounds like a verse from this song. Open house. It's a lot of fun. Try it with your friends. You know what I thought was amazing is, and I'm going to keep referring back to the documentary, which is maybe not the most kosher thing Let's if we're reviewing the record but i just think it's amazing if you do see i totally recommend to anyone to see it and the, and the, by the, the way film? The, the film the documentary which it took me a while to figure this out but so the documentary film uh was filmed during rehearsals for the show because lou said i do not want if they originally they were going to film the performances uh, and Lou said, I don't want a camera mm. in between me and the audiences. So if you do the show, if you film the live show, you can't get any shot. Camera can't be anywhere mm. in between the audience and us. Mm. Mm. So the guy who made it said, well, that doesn't work. So how about if I film the rehearsals? So the bulk of what we see in the video is actually the rehearsals leading up to those first performances right and those performances take place before the recording of the album right in, in fact they did they originally think this is only a live thing it's not going to be an album i got uh, that sense there well so it was commissioned yeah. so the work was commissioned um by uh the church of saint anne's which is where they performed it in collaboration with the Brooklyn Academy, Academy of, Music. of Music. Bam. And um so it was commissioned as a piece to do a live a live piece. Um but uh I don't know exactly if they didn't think they were gonna record it or if they just thought, well, we'll probably do a record afterward as a foregone conclusion. Or maybe they it was step at a time because they didn't uh, know when they were gonna start fighting and never want to right, see right exactly other. and you know so remember they started back in in 87 the idea came up and by about and then they were then they were busy lou with 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 new york and john with uh words for the dying they both the records and touring and that and that sort of thing so but in in 89 they get together and they start uh they start working together and I just want to get to some of this. Oh, I love this part. It's well, it's it's beautiful. Moon. Where John comes in is lovely. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to say though about what was so amazing to me watching the thing is that it really was complete. Like what we hear on the record. Oh yeah. Uh is Yeah. 
almost exactly there's some phrasing that Lou's phrasing is is slightly different like he's still working out exactly how he wants to phrase things mm -hmm. um and there's just one or two tiny little things at the end of style it takes there's a chord change in the live version that i don't think is on the on the recorded version at yeah. the very end where Lou comes in and does but it's not it's not like they went okay. oh now it's but time no, to make the record nothing version. is let's radically hire, different let's hire like, a string section and right exactly and, you know. no it's exactly the same like it's worked out and the 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 album is really very much a document of of the performance um hmm. okay okay this is what this is what Lou says uh after Andy died, we got together over a period of three weeks around Christmas 1987 yeah. in a rehearsal room up on 9th Avenue and 50th Street. I came up with the concept of Songs for Drilla, John says, and then went to Harvey Lichtenstein, head of the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and arranged for us to perform it there. We had our text. We sat down. The tapes were running. So they basically got together. Uh, and just turned a tape recorder on and started playing songs. Um, later, uh, interestingly enough, sort of, so it, and right, right there begins the whole sort of clouded story of, of credit for this record. Does Kale uh, later claim well, one thing in Lou? So, like Lou at first says things uh he's quoted in Musician magazine early on saying it was a hundred percent collaboration. Yeah. Uh and then later after the record comes out and after they do some promo stuff, uh and also tellingly after the, the film is edited and John goes off to work on another project. <laughs> uh, yeah. Lou suddenly starts uh, talking out talking out the other side of his mouth about yeah. the record saying like oh no I really it's 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 my record and John was you know he was just there is that um, is that Lou being Lou or is it because it got great it, reviews that's or? Lou being yeah, well I mean but isn't that Lou being Lou I mean right. it's Lou being Lou yeah right and also it's John being John. He, he's just as big as an ego. Like it's hard reading the John stuff to be like, I, I you can't like, I don't, I don't, you know, the, what the truth of it is, I think lost uh, to history. Can I point mm. out and two I, moments? I, in nobody this can song? tell you John. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, go yeah, finish I'm that. Sorry, finish I just that. talked over the thing. Well, I just, I just think that there's probably was a point at which both John and Lou believed that what they thought about it was true. And both of them right, and that both and, of them were probably wrong their, about that. Their poison um, mind poisoned themselves. They, yeah, they, and I mean it's fascinating because even in the stuff that John writes about it, within within the same page, he contradicts himself. Right. First, he says Lou went off and he wrote all the lyrics, and I worked on the arrangements. Later, like a paragraph later, in a yeah. book, he says, uh, <laughs> "You know, uh, uh, I contributed a lot to the lyrics." You know, so it's just it's very messy. And that could it, have been like he edited in the who, editing phase. He yeah, did. Who knows? Who we knows? all know his book needed an editor. We've discussed that before. Yeah. There's two phrase. There's the way he phrases this moment when he goes, "You look great." I think. I think <laughs> this is. Yeah. I won't even be there. Yeah. You look great. You look great. I think that's just such a great... which is great, and which he doesn't deliver in quite that same way in the in the documentary. And then you know this should be this should be a deeply embarrassing moment where you sing about your own band, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but this is this is what's so great about it is and yeah. this is what I mean. Like they were able to really take their egos out. Like yes, so, like yes, the song, this is the, the crux song of it. That follows this. Yes, is defines it work. Yes. All that matters is work. And in fact, uh, John says, I'm going to read this thing. I was going to save it till later, but this is, it's just perfect. And it, it really um, sums it up. Uh, hang on. 
Um, Lou and I need to take long breaks from each other. If somebody says, hey, you two, sit down and do this, it's no problem. We get on with our work, and it's very successful. But by the time we finished making Drella, I didn't want to work with him ever again. There had been too much smiling and gritting one's teeth. But the thing is, both of these guys, both John and Lou, uh, are people who, as creators, thrive off of a certain amount of collaborative conflict, like mm -hmm. working with someone who is mm -hmm. not like them, working mm -hmm. with someone who is uh, a frictive, a fricative. <laughs> Yeah, you know, to their to their own. I call them talents. like frenemy collaborations. Yeah, they're totally frenemies, and and they folk and when they're focused on work, they're great because that's what they do. They mm -hmm. focus on work, and these are they literally put their personal feelings for each other are just out of the room. They just aren't in the room when it happens, um, which is interesting because this this comes up in that podcast, Lior, that you. Uh, that you sent that uh where they where he where that 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 guy is talking to the the filmmaker mm -hmm. um and he talks about like you, you know because the the interviewer asked him like well what was it like with these guys with their tension and stuff and he was like that never came up like whatever that was it wasn't there like right. like it was before I had his time job to yeah. do they had their job to do and they did it they like do their work and they get it done and they do it well um it's but, work but yeah, yeah yeah and then afterwards uh they never want to see each other again because they don't but the next year they're doing a velvet's reunion which right, you know right, doesn't right, last which long is hilarious right because john is saying like i never wanted to work with him again but he does it's like they're drawn you know they can't mm -hmm. you know because they both crave that conflict they crave that like and you can see it in these looks in the in the yes. video there's <laughs> it's brilliant he captures these looks and yet yes they're looking at each other to make sure that they're in time and that they've got the beat but there's a there's something burning yes. in both of their <laughs> eyes that's like a I I'm not gonna fuck this up are you gonna fuck this up like mm. like a real there's a challenge and in the moments, in like in style it takes where he sings about the velvet underground or later on when it's stuff about like when he recites the stuff about the diary Rose, stuff yeah. where he reads about himself right uh john and does, his yeah. yeah like and and he reads about lou and and they're both sitting there like they're so stoic about mm. the whole thing mm. you know it's like they've really achieved that point of artists who separate themselves from like the work is the work mm -hmm. yeah and like i created the work but i am not the work i am not of the work the work you know like i wonder actually when i would love to know uh like what was written first and at what point they started reading the diaries which were published in the same year but i can't i mean they must have gotten hold of them before they were published or they must have had some access to them but well, they know. did yeah uh, you know because uh that song a dream is uh it's it's mashed up bits from the diary like yeah, you well, can, if you look if you like do a search on a pdf of the diary of of the like the phrases in that song you'll find right. them it's a collage point you to different pa yeah, yeah. The different places like certain sentences right so this is what john uh writes about it um specifically that he says, well, first of all, he says this, after I'd written all the music <laughs> and we'd got all the song structures together, Lou went off and wrote all the lyrics. So this is very interesting. This is a sentence where he says, I wrote all the music, Lou wrote all the lyrics. A paragraph later is saying like, as my lyrical contributions were such and such, whatever. But what's interesting about it is this. He says, um, but if I'd known some of the things uh, Lou went off and wrote all of the lyrics, which were immaculate. But if I'd known some of the things I now know, I would have pointed out that they were hardly honest. The dream, for example, does not seem to derive from the actual Warhol diaries. In an interview, he said, of course, some people said I got those words from the diaries, but it's not true. But I suppose if you want to bother and research it, go ahead. 
He didn't let me in on the process at all, and I was shy about it. I mean, I know that he's a good lyricist. But I can also read, and the words in that smoked <laughs> song were taken from Andy's diaries, <laughs> although not all from one place. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Seems like a quibble to so, me. Yeah, I mean, they... I mean, they... They pe- they patched it together into a gorgeous. Yeah, it, it, I, the thing it is, is that is, you know is. Lou is Lou loves to. He's a big creator of his own myth, you know. Yeah, the yeah. myth of Lou, and so of course, and he loves to be contrary. So of course, after this came out, and people are like, "Oh, that's the diaries." He's like, "Now, let me ask you, completely original." <laughs> let me ask you guys something. I wrote the diaries. <laughs> I, I wrote I'm Andy. Andy Warhol. I am Andy. <laughs> I, painted, it. I painted the soup can. Oh, um, I'm a soup. I'm a Catholic. I am soup. Besides, <laughs> uh, soup. but besides expressing, you know, fondness and in, in indebtedness and grief, what are they saying about Andy in this album? You think? Like, what do you get a full? I'm I'm impressed about you know that clip you sent us today, Evan, where they're, they're like they're like you know you listen to uh, nobody but you, and that's not very flattering to Andy, and yeah. it and was Luke's like, like eh. he's like in the context, you know, I'm just surprised. I am so impressed how they yeah. painted each they 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 do a good, well rounded portrait of a person. It's not one, you know, it's not just their friendship side. They talk about like there's moments where you you feel like. You know, it's a very general public. I think this I think one of the reasons it. why this record is so affecting is that they really put everything aside in service of the work. Yeah. And um they're honest. Mm-hmm. They're honest about Andy, at least Andy as they understood him. They're honest about themselves, at least as they understand themselves. Yeah, um, Lou actually expresses regret Lou <laughs> in is, the last song. Lou is <laughs> a raw nerve at some parts here. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a, a, a you know, in that interview uh, that I sent you guys, John says, I think it's there. He says, like, nobody except Lou could have done this. Hmm. And I, I think that's really true. Um, I don't know who else. Even with the um, ego of these two men, do you think um, they understand that their career might not have happened if it wasn't for Andy? Oh, absolutely. I th- I think that's apparent in the yeah in the work itself. I think it's implied in the creation of this. Yeah. I think it totally is. I think it totally is. There's a huge sense of 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 in debt and 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 in what. You know, in interviews, both of them say like the, what so much of what so much of what I learned, like when people ask them about like, well, how did you take this? How did you do this? Like, well, it's like Lou says in one of the songs, when I can't think what I should do, I think what would have Andy, what would Andy have said? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, um, I think they really it's it. It's very heartfelt. And like, I, yeah, they're it, big egos, but they're able to like. You know they're they're big egos, but they're real artists, and yeah. they're able to do what real artists do, which is put all that shit aside and tell the truth, like talk the truth about something. I um, think it, I think it's come up in this podcast before, but when um, you know people like to goof on like, oh, what did Andy actually? Do? He's a producer. I mean, come on, on the you know the Banana album especially, right? Um, yeah. But there's that great Lou clip where he kind of cuts a reporter off. And he says he was a protector. And yep. he says what what Andy's actual function was is like all these other people get involved and they try to muddle with your ideas. And he was the guy who was just like, no, it's perfect. It's great. Yeah. And just mm-hmm. let them. That's such a it... fascinating uh, yeah. thing to latch on to, because in the in one of the interviews, uh, John says. Well, we felt we had to do it uh, to protect him. Yeah. Wait, John, to protect who? Andy. Andy. They had to that do part what? of part of doing this record was oh, an act yeah. of protecting Andy, protecting Andy's image from from because because there's so many blown up stories and there's all this crap, you know. And oh yeah, it wasn't an artist. Felt... He didn't work hard. He didn't even right. do his own. Yeah, everything's a rip off with this guy. Yeah, yeah. 
and he the, was a real the, person. The he lazy, wasn't, yeah. he wasn't just a he wasn't just a media society Andy who paints and records them. <laughs> no, he likes to be around a lot of people, but please yeah. don't touch like that. Right. That is so revealing. It's a great, yeah. It's it's a great character study, even if it wasn't a real person. I think it's a fascinating, and 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 in fact, it's interesting that we shouldn't forget the full official title is songs for drella dash a fiction is it which, really yes it is that's how they, it was why would they as, do that <laughs> it's such a loo touch where is that listed i i don't think it's on the record but that's how it was done as the show when they presented the oh, show huh. songs for drella a fiction oh It'd we should do like i feel like yeah. punctuation is the key to that because like if it was a comma then the fiction would refer to Drella. Right. And you'd be like, ah, so this is a, a way that we, you could, like, the only way to think about Warhol in a way that's at all coherent is to think about him in terms of fiction. It's and not much fiction more as ambiguous. Lies, but fiction is a it's, kind of communication. But, but with it, no it's not comma. a colon, it's not a comma, it's the ambiguous dash, <gasps> which could be read as evil. <laughs> A M dash should maybe. Uh, also, yeah. I don't know if you saw it, but did you read the? Did you listen to that bit at the beginning where Lou denies knowing what the word Drella even yeah. means? Well, I wanted to say because the listeners <laughs> might not know, you know, the songs for Drella. We've been told Andy Warhol's nickname was Drella, and I always heard yes. it was a done deal. It's half Dracula, it, it, half it was, Cinderella. It was, it was a it was a term come up with by Andy and. Uh, Warhol superstar on Dean. Superstar on yep. Dean. Uh, that was a combination of Dracula and Cinderella to sort of encapsulate the two sides of of Andy Warhol. Mm -hmm. And now, Lou being Lou, of course, has to be contrary in this interview. He says, oh, I, have, I haven't the slightest idea what it means. Uh, that was around long before I got there. Some people say it's a contraction of Drella, Dracula and Cinderella. Some people say it means, and I forget, it's some... He says a foreign phrase, and then, sure goes, and then he goes, little bitch. And it means bitch. little bitch. <laughs> um, <laughs> he pretends not to know. But here's the thing. It means Dracula and Cinderella. And even if it doesn't, it makes sense to interpret it that way. And it works for the record because... It's yes. that contraction yeah. of a dark and light, but both fantastical fictional, both are fantastical creations, right? Both are dream right, right. creations. But one is the sort of dark side, the vampiric feeding the off of side. And the uh, the other is 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 the the rescued from the rescued from poverty, the 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 safe the the saved victim. The you plebe know, the, whose dream comes true, at least right, temporarily. Exactly. Right. And Wait, and is a princess. He's always over an abyss. He's a princess. What's and that, Leo? The other ones are... He's always over an abyss. Like yes. you, you never Cinderella doesn't feel it's not a story of safety. Yeah. Right. It's no, not until precarious. the very, very end. Um, and you don't really believe that ending, right. do you? Oh. How, how dare you? <laughs> how far can my fantasy but, go? But the whole the whole album, the whole project works on that dichotomy. Works on these yeah, two right. these two sides of who this person is. This side that's very giving and loving, that yeah. that has open houses and does this and that. And then the side that's like, I know this person died, but I don't. It wasn't. It's not my fault. Right. Yeah. 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 It wasn't like me. you know, these or if two... you if you read the last decade of World's Diaries, you know he's genuinely sad that Lou's just not talking to him anymore yeah without yeah. explanation and it really bummed me out yeah yeah i mean this... lou's lou in hello it's me at the very end um well maybe we should we're only up to want... images well we can... I, I, there's a great progression here and like oh maybe images is a great time to stop and just mention the fact that at a point in time oh man what year was it there was a ballet <laughs> Yes, you showed Man. us a clip. Did yeah. you guys see the clip? See that? No. Maybe 2004 or something? Yeah. yeah. Uh, much later on. And the audio sounds like... A ballet called Songs for Drilla, ostensibly based on this record. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is deeply, deeply weird. Um, anyway, the song Images makes me think of that because it's... 
Like to put put this composition out without bass and drums is itself a risk. No, it's so great though. It's so brilliant because it's this like punky, like the songs on here that are these like punky driving songs that are basically metal songs. Like they're very like heavy. They're like heavy, but they don't have the bass and the drums, so they don't sound heavy. Um, but they're great. Uh, it's great in images. Images is the song where live, it's great to watch Lou really struggle. Uh, it, and this is also one of those things where you can tell that it was John who did the the composition and the arrangement of the songs. The timing is so weird in some of these things mm -hmm. and so complicated. Uh, it's not Lou. That's not Lou's musical right. song. Lou's musical songwriting is nobody but you. Not this. Not um, Starlight. Do 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 Like all that is very, and this is too. In the in the live version, the song is so fast uh, that Lou is really struggling to play the guitar and sing at the same time. <laughs> uh huh. That's funny. <laughs> but I do have to say, I want to say this that I think that in the in the video and on the record, Lou's guitar playing is just fantastic like what he plays what he actually plays like particularly when he takes these solos they're they're incredible mm, i feel yeah. like lou gets a lot of slack gets a lot of crap for like not being a great actually a great guitar player but mm. this this record proves that wrong like it's his really guitar expressive. playing is, is really expressive and it's not easy guitar playing like there's a lot of like stuff where he's playing a bass line on the guitar and a top line on top of it that's not it's advanced and it's really good stuff with no drums to have as your pair right your, yeah. your your uh safety net either i mean it's... right that that the sense of time and i i think it speaks to the just the connection between the two of them like they have a lifetime of connection to draw on you know, as, mm. as performers and collaborators. And they haven't collaborated in, what is it at this point, 20 years? 20 years, yeah. And they're amazing. Like, they're amazing. You ever it does, wonder... The album, there's not a point in, in this record where I, I want there to be anything else. Mm. Yeah. And what's crazy to me is that a number of the reviews when this came out were incredibly dismissive of the musical element really of what they're dismissive like what? the the musical element they're like oh. Lyr Lou's lyrics are great and it's a great like lyrical study but like the music is this boring like background blah blah really? and i'm like i don't get that at all like I, I don't understand that point of view like you can't like you must not be listening to yeah, it right. at all because musically i yeah, it's just fantastic. We, I want to, I want names of these critics. We're gonna track yeah. them down. We're gonna track them down and get Everything's them. so much more ominous when you're petting a cat. Which yeah. is what yeah, it's true. Are doing. you petting a? We're gonna Twilight, get them. Twilight's right here. Yeah. We'll get them all, Twilight, won't we? Um, we'll get them. Uh, uh, oh, you do you guys ever spend time? Uh, what do you think the third Velvet's album would have been like if John didn't get fired? the quiet one yeah would it have been the would've quiet been, one it would have been less quiet okay great and didn't you want to put a bunch of speakers and answers. Under, underwater he did want to put speakers underwater yeah but that was one of the reasons why like he had that. to leave <laughs> it would have sounded exactly the same but underwater yeah but with, so it would have been like underwater. Underwater. <laughs> 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 Rock Lobster. <laughs> I don't know. The Fantastic Dream. Nobody But You is a great song. Yeah. It's a great loose. Oh, song. yeah. It's so, so dark. Oh, man. Um, there's this moment, though, in the, in the, rehe in the video where John goes off on this horrible, uh, like, synthesizer electric piano solo mm -hmm. and it sounds like something from like a bad leonard cohen album from like that it's like 
And it's so great that like that didn't end up on the, on the <laughs> album. <laughs> It's I like gotta, I gotta hear that. where it was like, oh, which song? Nobody but you. Oh, I think I remember that. He does a little. He does a little. It sounds like he does. It sounds like his little Caribbean sunset moment. Yeah, it, it does have a little. It bit. sounds like a little Jimmy Buffett, like, do, 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 do. <laughs> like he's doing like a a synthesizer version of like uh like a tindrum kind. Of, oh God, it's bad. Wow, that's true. Evan, have you pulled some pull quotes from the reviews? at all um oh man what do i have again i have like too many windows um no i i you know i don't i don't think i have pull quotes i just had my sort of summary thing because there wasn't anything particularly enlightening in the mm. in the comments i just found it was interesting that that oh by and far the reviews were similar in saying that uh the reviews at the time were similar in saying that uh, you know, it's it's a really interesting um, document and a tribute to to Andy that like these are the two people who only two people who could have done it. Blah blah blah. But uh, like the lyrics are good, but the music is boring. Hmm. Uh, I wonder what they. I wonder what people want. But I think later on, I think the, the retrospective reviews. <laughs> kind of understand it a little bit better like i just don't understand your reaction to the music like the music is great because it doesn't have bass and drums it's boring to you well, i know I, Evan, like it's not rock it's you, not a rock album you dumb fuck. and maybe people wanted it to be a rock record like well, but it's not i remember listening to this pretty naively evan I, you had it and we were like 15 or 16 yeah and i wonder whether it's we i think we could hear it uh, and we could hear it i think we could hear it and appreciate it um, and I wonder why that was. I wonder why we would have come to it uh, able to hear it. And I wonder whether it's because we came from the... Because like, we were theater people? Theater people. <laughs> yeah, for real. Maybe I'm, it's part I'm not of kidding. that. We're going to put on but a show me, and honor our... But to me, brand. musically, like, I, yeah, it is it is like theater in that it's a song sequence that tells a story and they did it live on a stage, so it's theater. But to me, it's 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 much more like me on the musical level it's and overall it's more like spoken word set to like chamber music yes. I wonder if, except I think it, the it, opener it, and the closer they purposely frame it with oh, these yeah. two very like that are that are very we're gonna much, save the orphanage yeah, with that the are big very show. Much musical songs yes. but they're also great songs they're yeah. also like they're not cheesy Neither, no, I love no. both of those songs. And hello, it's me. This is, makes me cry. Is, is, Absolutely, is, yeah. Lou is so emotionally vulnerable on this. It's like, you, Lou, you big softy. But he knows it's this show closer. He yeah. talks about. He's and like, he talks I, ho about I it. hope you like you a like little, little show. Little show. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's just a show. It's, so, it's maybe the most it's sincere and openly emotional moment, unguarded moment in his whole discography. Could well, this be? and that's the and, original rapper. <laughs> well, no, I would say this and and some of what he does on uh, Magic and Loss after yeah. this. He there's a a, a open. I, it, Lou true. is kind of an open wound. He loses a lot of people, uh, or he thinks he loses a lot of people. He feels like he lost a lot of people. He probably did he lose a lot of people, but there's session. one person that he thought he lost. Uh, who was it? Um, Rotten Rita, who he mourns in. Uh, but she's not actually Halloween dead. Parade. She wasn't. He wasn't dead then. And really? Rotten Rita is one of the two people he's mourning in Magic and Loss, and he wasn't dead then either. But he was dying. He didn't, no, he wasn't dying. He had just disappeared from the scene, and Lou, I think, had assumed that he was dead. <laughs> wow. I well, mean, you know, <laughs> you think someone's dead? There's but some. That's, there, there's but a, that's. But see, that's Lou for you. It. It, 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 that's that's a brilliant that's kind of a that's kind of like a key to understanding Lou though doesn't matter if it's real if if Lou feels it as real <laughs> it's the real same feel. with, I mean but that's like that's how feels. that's 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 how he is as an artist it's like it's artistically real yeah do you know they... it's, it's 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 real enough for it to be artistic fodder 
what Werner Herzog would call the ecstatic truth. Yeah. Do you, do you know another he... another another great artist uh, uh, who is all about work. Oh man, can you imagine if Werner had directed, directed the... this thing? I like the direction. You know what's funny, Evan? This is purely. I can see Klaus Kinski playing Lou Reed. The um this this director, uh, whose name is, oh man, I lost Edgar Ed, Ed Edward Lachman. Edward Lachman. Yeah. Uh, the only other time that Evan and I we have seen other work of his because he was Mississippi the Masala. Mississippi Masala. Yeah, we Do you saw that we together. Saw that? Yes, we walked at, into at, that after at, walking out of Wayne's World. <laughs> Really? <laughs> yeah. You guys, you guys walked out of Wayne's weirdest, World. We that might be the coolest big, thing you've that, ever done. That we were, defines we were like, this uh, is shit. We were like, we're gonna walk out of Wayne's World and go into the small fucking indie film Mississippi Masala. Because that's Masala. that's right. Yeah. That's how cool and, and we are. I gotta tell you, I remember every minute of that movie. I no, I'm don't, kidding. I, I, don't, I, I don't remember any minute of that movie. I remember that happening though. Yeah, um, which is more than I can say so for weird. most things in that time period. Um, I do remember. Was that at the? Was that at Harvard in Harvard? I can't remember, I don't know. Yeah, what movie theater would have combined those two things? I can't, they Harvard, were in the Brattle, same Harvard Film Archive. That's what I was thinking. Was it was well, the Brattle? But a, why the would they have church? The one on Church Street. Were they showing Wayne's World? No, it wouldn't have been Brattle. And did we walk out of Wayne's World or Wayne's World 2? It was Wayne's World 1. Really? Because that's a... Yeah. I know, that's a good movie. Film. Funny movie. I'm so glad yeah. we're... Let's take the time I told you, to really... we'll cut it. This is quite a... No, <laughs> you're not. I forbid Wayne's you World to cut this. It's Lior, a, it's I forbid you to cut film. this. <laughs> I just, it is. This is a... Lou, Lou lost track of a lot of people like that, I think. I think in the, ten, in the last 10 years, actually. He lost track actually. of Bill and Ted. I'm trying to say something sad. <laughs> You're going to sound like a monster in about a minute. Oh, no. You want to continue? Oh, no. In the last 10 years, they've only just now um, figured out what happened to... Oh, now I can't even think of a fucking name. Um, who was his, his trans partner of many years? Rachel. Rachel. Yeah. Rachel. Um, you know, they in the last 10 years found her nearly unmarked grave in a potter's field for AIDS oh, victims God. on an island off of New York where they were oh, burying God. AIDS victims oh, at the yeah. time. I mean, um, uh, so I think, you yeah. know, pe uh. there was a certain sense, Lou, people would ask what happened to Rachel and Lou would be like, oh, you don't, he would just be like, you don't want to know. I don't know yeah. how much, and you don't know how much he knew, but I think a lot of people yeah. like that in his life drifted out and then you know, yeah. sir, you don't maybe even know their real name. Their right. full and also, name. Lou is like, there's a real, there's an interesting part in that interview with the filmmaker. He talks about, he worked with Lou before. Oh, right. Making a promotional film for Berlin. For Berlin. Oh, wow. And he talked about, uh, because he talked about, you know, working on, on Trella and how Lou is very prickly and doesn't, doesn't trust people. Um, and, and he talked about that thing when, and he was trying to film stuff mm -hmm. for the Berlin thing mm -hmm. and that Lou just came up and like <laughs> kicked the tripod out right. from underneath his camera. <laughs> and yeah. then he was like, he asked Lou, you know, when they were doing this, he was like, Lou, do you remember? And Lou was like, I don't remember a lot of stuff from that time. Yeah. Same with so you there around some, your Wayne's there, world. There's some real, the real dark years for, for Lou, and but the, a lot of that comes through. Like I feel like in the last song, so much of that comes through. Like he really is remorseful. I, that's I, I've never heard such that's, a. That's what I'm saying. Authentic, yeah. and 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 what is particularly unique is not in a romantic sense. Like we're used to that shit. In, a, mm -hmm. in romantic, like, oh, I'm so sorry, baby. Right. Oh, I broke your heart, but now I'm back and I can dance. But like, I know I fucked. I like, fucked my friend like, over. This is like, oh shit. Yeah. You were a really important person, and I was an asshole to you. Yeah. I <laughs> and even... uh, I don't, I don't know how to make up for it. And this is the best I can do. A little show. It's yeah. this. 
and that's yeah. it. And I don't know how to do any better. And like, and we don't know, know if it was. Uh, it... And also, but in the same song, to be like, but you you hurt me. You right, right. you 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 wounded me, and I that was not okay. And I have these resentments that that line. I have resentments that can never be unmade. Yeah. You know, in, in when talking about someone who's dead, like that's so. I mean, that's that's heavy, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know how to put yeah. it. That's yeah. a, like anyone who's ever had someone who they had a complicated relationship with die. Like usually, the eulogy is very whitewashed. Yeah, yeah, but the but the real feeling is that is like, I miss you, but fuck you. But all this fucking shit is not resolved. Right. It's not God. It doesn't. It it doesn't dissolve into the ether the way mm. you do. You know, I'm stuck with it. Um, that's just so great. Uh, I think it's a fantastic record. I think it's a real high point. Uh, for both of them, at at a point where both of them were, were really firing on all cylinders, and uh, they both continued to do so for. A little while after this but it's it's um you know it's just fascinating that the life cycle of artists is interesting yeah you know and what you were saying artists is who are a... around a lot to have like a to have a early peak and then generally a fallow period and then a, a resurgent peak um i think it's probably the best thing that can happen for an artist and yeah. the serious, I mean, like you said earlier, they did this to protect him. The quality of this really speaks so highly of Andy's artistry. Like yeah. this, this, if he wasn't a fucking legit artist who knew what he was doing and was great, yeah, this wouldn't be good. Right. And this is so uncompromisingly artsy. Mm-hmm. Like I heard nobody but you on the radio. But like they were really trying hard to pull a single off of this record to put anything on the record. Like this is art rock, if it's rock at all. I don't mm-hmm. even think it's rock. Uh, I don't know. I don't it's, know what to. I think it's chamber. I, to me, it feels like chamber music it's, or a eulogy or elegy and song. Art theater rock. Yeah, elegy. It's something like it. It seems very early to me. Because I was trying to think of like how you view this as a collaboration, as such a strange idea of collaboration, when yeah, the, and the staging really accentuates this. You know, they're sitting on opposite sides of the stage. They don't talk. There's and no between them are these projections of Andy and things yeah. around Andy's life, and it reminds me. It makes me think of, um, you know, the things that were there before opera. Uh, mm-hmm. These passion plays, or um, mm. oh, I forget what they were even called. Uh, these pre opera things like the, you know, the Bach uh, Passion of St. Matthew or Passion yep. of St. Jude, where you have people on stage not really looking at one another, singing recitatives, singing arias, and the it's a it's a it's a play kind of thing, except there's no drama between the characters. It's, it's a story that's being told by several voices. Yeah. And, and they're it's... in conjunction with one another, but they're not really in 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 each other's view. That's really actually fascinating i think that hits the nail it's i feel like it's less of a play than it is a ritual 